Um, hello allerseits. Uh, I just ask in English really quick, anybody here in the room who doesn't speak German? All right, we have a couple. Um, is it okay if I have the do the presentation in English, or is anybody has anybody strong opinions to do the presentation in German? Is it okay when I the den Vortrag in English halte, or had irgendjemand damit um, quasi Probleme und würde gerne, dass ich den in Deutsch halte? Okay, Eng English scheint okay zu sein. All right. So this is a little bit more inclusive, I think, because um, there are two people here in the room who uh, I guess German is not the the mother tongue. English not the mother tongue for me either. But I have to admit that this presentation will be for me easier in English than in German because uh, I speak like 90% English uh, and like rarely in, in my work life in German. All right, um, since the question came up, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I actually grew up in Dresden, went to university in Dresden, so for me it's always fun to come back. And since it's a work trip, it's actually paid, which is amazing. Um, so what is a cloud developer advocate? Uh, so we understand our role as like the bi-directional interface between developers outside of Google that built on our platform and developers inside of Google that built the platform. So that's in a nutshell. So basically, please feel free to reach out to me if you have like any things where like you run into trouble to um, with any kind of like programs or SDKs or things that you want to try on GCP, on Google Cloud Platform, or even I'm talking today about, uh, today about Apache Beam. Um, if there are any issues with that, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Um, I will channel that into the right direction, and you help us actually to build a better product for you. All right, with that, that um, let's dive into, into that presentation. So the title is Processing Data Streams and Batches in One Model. I will go a little bit into the history, like how we got from batch processing to stream processing. Um, but just to start into this a little bit, like what is like processing data or big data all about? And it's basically the getting insights out of your data. What you want to have is you want to improve your business, you want to improve your user experience, you want to give them up-to-date data, you want to basically maybe even uh, adjust your application uh, interaction based on how your users are using your application, right? And especially if you have a lot of users, uh, it becomes a lot of data very, very quickly. So what are the steps of doing this, getting insight of, the, of your data? First step, of course, collecting the data. Uh, we don't gonna, we're not going to talk about that today. Second is, of course, processing your data, so um, running algorithms or certain kinds of things over your data to get insights out of your data. And the thing that we focus on in this presentation is about how do we process data um, in batch and in stream. So this is today's talk. So I'm not going to talk about like how you can collect data, and I'm not going to talk about like how what you're going to do with your insights, basically. All right, so how did we get from batch to stream processing? So I want to go back a little bit in the history of, of Google. And as you can imagine, with building a search engine, what you want to do is basically you want to find the information that your users are looking for. You want to present them with the information that your users are looking for. So, and the internet was growing and growing and growing, so you have more and more data basically to process. So you, we had to find a way to do that effectively. And we had to find a way actually where software developers were not always rewriting, like reinventing the wheel, right? We wanted to have data scientists and uh, data analysts concentrating on the analytics part, getting the insights out of the data and not about the infrastructure, how to move a data from A to B. So there are a couple of things that we have done over time, and many of these uh, innovations that we came up with are written into white papers or things that we, we, we have published. And many of those things actually have been picked up by the open source community, um, which we're really happy about, and further developed these, these concepts. So first thing uh, that I want to talk about is MapReduce. MapReduce basically, uh, kicked off like this massive data, big data processing in a very distributed way and very fault tolerant way. So what is MapReduce? Just to recap a little bit, you basically have your data, you chunk your data in, in partitions, and then you give these partitions to machines, individual machines. 
and these machines run uh, user uh, provided functions. So that's a map process, They're extracting them data, extracting a key out of it. Um, then this is shuffled. So you shuffle that data and uh, move that data to, to your reducer machines. And in your reducer machine, again, you run a user-defined function, um, which, for instance, does an aggregation of uh, all that data for a specific key. The nice thing with this concept is you can pretty much get any kind of big data processing algorithm into that concept. Like it's a very, very powerful concept, but you might have to uh, convolute your algorithm beyond recognition. So it might be really hard for the next developer to understand what you're doing. But it is possible pretty much that to shuffle every big data algorithm into, into that model of map shuffle and reduce. So what's great about this model is now we could basically write a framework and an infrastructure around this where the infrastructure would take care of all the data movement and uh, fault tolerance. So if a machine falls down, the framework and the infrastructure take care, takes care of restarting another machine and redistributing that piece of data which went on that machine, basically to this machine, so that we can pick up that work. And in the end, the infrastructure takes care of the fault tolerance. The data analyst really only has to describe what is happening in the, in the respective steps. So now, Map and Reduce is powerful, and um, if you give developers a powerful tool, they're going to do crazy things. So they want to do a little bit more, like they want to do more complex things. They want more like complex data pipelines. And even though we uh, remove this um, burden of moving data between machines within one and Map Reduce job, we didn't have anything basically to combine multiple Map, map and Reduce jobs. So the next step was basically finding a framework where we could describe a data pipeline, a batch data pipeline, which then is compromised or, uh, com comprised of multiple map and reduce jobs, but where, where the data analyst basically can describe um, what is happening in this pipeline, and then we run this in, in, um, in, in map and reduce jobs. So that's where Flume Java comes in. Uh, Flume Java is basically a higher level API where you describe basically the data processing steps and then in the back end then the Flume Java basically translates that into uh, map, map and reduce jobs and run that at map and reduce jobs. And with that it also takes care of moving the data between individual jobs. So again it's like one higher level abstraction and makes it more powerful to process data. So how does that look like? We basically uh, define this uh, higher level API, and if you know Spark, for instance, this might look uh, very familiar for you. So basically, we have a P collection. Here in this uh, example, we want to get the mean, like the average temperature or the mean temperature at like locations, for instance, so, like, if you have multiple sensor locations. So we get this sensor event in, which, for instance, has a location code and a timestamp and a temperature. And then we get that into this P collection, which is basically a collection which we can parallel process. Um, and so what we do on this raw sensor data is we apply a user function that you see there with the par do dot off, and we parse the sensor event and return key value pairs of like the location and, and the temperature. And then in the next step, we, we do the aggregation. So here you see the mean double per key. So per key, per location that we have, per sensor location, we calculate the mean temperature. And then we write that back to, to a data think. So very simple, um, but powerful. So Flume Java came around, and at Google, everybody started to write Flume Java um, jobs to process data, Actually, a lot of data. But if you look at data, data is not just basically just you get a lump of data and you process it. Usually the data comes in like very continuously. So you basically have data that is more in like daily uh, batches or like how you to process this. So I'm sorry, this went out of, so we do live update of um, order. Huh. So, um, Actually, no. Let's leave it like that. So basically, um, basi like, what, what do we do with this unboundedness of data that always data comes in pretty much every day if you collect data? Um, what we do is basically we do this chunking of data, right? So we, we um, 
to put it in batches, for instance, of days or hourly or things like that. And then we process these batches of data. Now, that seems amazing, but what, what, like, are we done yet? Like, map and use? Can we, like, stop this presentation? Not really. Like, there are a couple of uh, big problems with, with this kind of model of processing big data. The first issue of batch processing is actually the latency, right? So if you post, like, put your data into, for instance, daily batches, then you can process your data at the end of the day. And then you get insights in your data, basically, pretty much up to 24 hours later after an event happened. Like, the, like uh, usually even more because the processing takes time. Right. So if you want to get more like accurate, more real-time insights, what do you do? You basically make smaller and smaller batches. Now, if you do smaller and smaller batches, you run into another problem. And you run more and more into this problem, the smaller you make these batches. So for instance, if you want to get insights into sessions, how your users are using your application, they run really quickly across these boundaries, these artificial boundaries that you put on your data. So for instance, if you put, uh, have a daily uh, batch job and your users are very night active and they uh, usually work around midnight, then these users basically, the sessions of these users get uh, broken up and you, they end up in, in, in two different batches. So you don't get actually consistent data view when you analyze your data for these users. The, lo the smaller you get with these batches, the more these problems come in. So somehow we need to fix this. So if you look at actually data, it's not like these artificial batches of data that you process and you make them smaller and smaller to get the insights faster. It is actually a continuous unbounded data stream that you get and you have to find a way to actually process continued, continuous unbounded uh, data. So, and there comes another problem in, um, that we also have to look at. If you look at continuous unbounded data, it's not only that this data comes in continuously, but also that it comes in delayed. So as an example, for instance, you pour, support an offline mode in your application, and your user uses your application on the plane, and they are on an international flight to somewhere nice uh, with palm trees and sun. And once they land there, they basically uh, turn on their Wi-Fi again or their, their uh, network provider, and all these events suddenly stream into your system. Right? Um, so if you pro process these events once they come in, they are actually not really accurate in the sense of like, that the insights get, that you get out, to, out of this data because the events actually happen at a different time than they come into your system to, to process them. Another problem is also, like for instance, if you suddenly get a lot of data into your systems and your systems are not capable of handling these uh, large amount of data streams, you basically de are delaying the processing of the data. And again, you get delays in terms of like, when, the, when events happen to when you actually process the event and get the insights out of this. So to address these challenges, we came up with something called Mealville. And Mealville is a system that basically provides a directed acyclic graph of um, elements of processing your data. And that basically the data flows through this da a directed acyclic graph and you do like element um, transformations, grouping, windowing, and then aggregations. And to make them correct, we had to come up with a couple of uh, notations to, and ask the right questions about the data to actually come up with a consistent view of the insights that we're getting out of this data. So just a couple patterns of like, what you can do with streaming processing. So the first one, the first pattern that we look into is element-wise transformation. So that is very easy. Like here in this example, we filter out of our data stream, for instance, the yellow boxes. So that can be done continuously. You don't have to worry about delays or things like that in this case here. Um, so that's not, not challenging. But the next thing is like, if you now want to count these yellow boxes, like when do you count these yellow boxes? You have an unbounded stream. So you start with, with the things that we just talked about earlier. You start uh, putting artificial boundaries again. So here we have putting batches and then we basically uh, can aggregate per these batches. But as said, um, these, these events might be delayed, so you actually have to put them in the right buckets to uh, calculate the right um, uh, results. 
So for session windows, that would look like something like that. The session windows, again, could also come in delayed. So you have to find some like user ID, for instance, and group these events by, by user ID into like session streams. So let's have a look at like time in a bit different way to actually make it easier to, ca to aggregate and uh, analyze your data uh, while keeping or getting consistent and correct results. So here in this graph, we have um, the event time and the processing time. So the event time is basically when an event happens. So if I tap on my phone and it is um, 505, that's when the event happens. Uh, by the time it, it lands in, in your system and is ready for processing in your system, that's basically the processing time. That could be 50501 or it could be 508, for instance. Right? So we have this uh, line here, this gray dashed line, and that is basically our idle uh, watermark, like our idle um, like real-time uh, processing line, so to say. So if you find any events here in this area down here, please let me know. We might have a really good job for you. Um, so if you find events here, that would basically mean you, you know about events before they are happening. So you know how to time travel, and then we are really interested. Um, so all events are basically happening in this uh, upper left uh, triangle. triangle. And so the line, the red line that you see there is basically my, my system processing these events. And as said, like your system could be overloaded, so processing slows down, or you have like very heavy computation. So the more you basically go away from when the event happened, the further away you go uh, from this dashed line, and this, we call this uh, a skew. So now if we separate these two times, if we look at like when events are happening and when they, when they are processed, we can actually do very powerful things. But before I go into detail like how we do this, like the separation of uh, event and process time, I want to look a little bit at like what our like state-of-the-art um, data processing pipelines uh, look like. So usually the, the questions that you ask yourself if you look at data processing is uh, one of three, at least one of three questions. One is like completeness, um, so completeness and correctness basically, uh, like of the results that you get out, get out of your data processing. Second one is like how much latency are you accepting? Is it okay to wait a day till you get insights of your data or um, do you want to have like seconds or sub-minute um, insights in your data? And the third of war, of course, is like about cost. How much money are you willing to spend on your data pipelines to get insights like correct or even low latency? So I want to give a couple of examples here. So let's look, for instance, at the, at the billing pipeline. Now, if you invoice your customers, what's really important, of course, is completeness and correctness of your, of your invoice. You don't want to send a wrong invoice to your customer. So you actually spend a lot of money, uh, probably, um, to actually have them correct, because you don't want to have bad customer reviews and, and impressions. So here in this graph, basically, um, we have these three, three criteria, completeness, low latency, and low cost. And um, the higher the graph, uh, the more important is this part. Now, so billing pipeline latency is not very important. Um, if like your bill goes out like an hour or a day or even a couple of days uh, after after your uh, customer has used your system, that is, I guess, fine. Um, the earlier you get the money, of the better, of course. But like it is not something critical that needs to go out in real time. And then. Again, uh, low, po low cost is not that important because you want to really make sure that these are correct. Another one is like if you want to give your customers a little bit more uh, convenience function and a more like a way to guide their usage of a certain system, then this is something that you actually want to have a, a more real time, uh, closer, um, uh, like with lower latency results in, in your applications. So here, low latency is, is important, but it doesn't need to necessarily be correct to the last cent, right? So if you have multiple systems involved that are sending uh, like cons consummation data to your aggregation system, to your data pipeline system, and some of these systems might be a little bit delayed, then you might get a little, little uncorrect uh, 
um, live forecast of your costs. But for the customers to see like the ballpark of where they are going with their spending is something very good for them to, to, to gauge the use of, of an application and to get an impression uh, how they are using a system. And here, like, of course, you also don't want to use up all your, re your re revenue um, by writing these pipelines. So you want to look at like, uh, lower costs to have these live cost estimates. A third example here is abuse uh, detection. So here, um, completeness is to somewhat important. I could make that a little bit bigger, this bar, but basically what you want to have, you want to, of course, avoid that somebody is abusing your system and, and cutting into your revenue um, or into your uh, yeah, uh, win of money, basically. Now, what you also want to avoid, of course, is to mark some of your good customers as fraudulent customers. So you want to spend a little bit of uh, effort into make them make it at least to some, to some extent uh, correct and then also have some remedy structures in place to deal with the case if you um, have like false positives or false negatives. Um, and then here uh, for, for these abuse detection, low cost is not so important because um, the more you can avoid abuse, of course, the more you save money. So you can actually spend a little bit on this uh, abuse detection pipeline. Now, if we look at these examples, like how do we uh, run these as like today in most of the companies. And that's where uh, like a pattern has been established, which is called a Lambda architecture. So Lambda architecture is basically you have your data stream, you uh, have like batch processing, which is your correct and exalt, uh, exact results, and then you have your stream processing to get a little bit more real time. Uh, information insights in your data and then you have like a data sync where you try to reconcile the differences and challenges um, of running two different systems. Now what are the other things, the downsides of this uh, architecture? It is powerful but also there are a lot of downsides of this architecture. You have as you see usually um, possibly two infrastructures to maintain. Uh, you have different software stacks that you have to maintain to run these two. And by that also means you have uh, like, uh, like different skill sets in your software developers that are needed to, to program data pipelines for these two systems. So um, as an example for, for batch processing, you could at, like, uh, look at Spark, for instance. And then as an example for, for stream processing, you could, for, uh, for instance, look at uh, Apache Flink. Or, or Apache Kafka as well. Um, so how do we reduce this burden of maintaining multiple infrastructure as well as having software developers learn multiple uh, programming languages and, and software stacks to deal with? So this is where Dataflow and Apache Beam come in. So we basically took Mealwheel, uh, packaged this into an SDK and open sourced this SDK as Apache Beam. Now, so this SDK basically gives you a programming model that I'm going to explain in a little bit. But it also gives you an ecosystem where multiple um, companies and open source projects board into to support this programming model on top of their software stack. So the Apache Beam model, once you basically write your pipelines in Apache Beam, you can run them on multiple different uh, runners. And one of them is, is Dataflow, and I'm going to show a little demo uh, later on. So just in, uh, in a nutshell again, um, Apache Beam gives you a portable and parallel data processing. It has like a higher level API, an abstract uh, programming model that you use to write your pipelines. And then it basically, uh, you support it basically in a distributed manner that you can run this in a distributed processing runtime environment. So let's get a little bit in more detail like how we went from batch into, into stream processing with the, with the Apache Beam uh, programming model. So again, I talked already about processing time versus event time. Again, this dashed line is our, our real time, is our real world. So there is nothing happening in the lower right uh, triangle. And then we have a couple of events that are coming in. So event three happened around uh, between 12.06 and 12.07 and comes in between 12.07 and 12.08. So it becomes in pretty close to when this event happened. And event nine comes in uh, quite a bit later. So 
to get correct results out of this, we have to ask the right question. First, what are we, what were, what are we calculating, actually? What are we doing with this data that we have? Where in event times are, are these results calculated? So how do we group these events by event time or other things? Um, and then when in processing time are we materializing results? So with, I mentioned that events can come in later. Now you might want to decide like how much do you delay to actually materialize a result out of your data in, in a certain batch or in a certain session um, so that you get still low latency information from, from your data. And then the last one is about uh, refinements, where you basically decide of like, do you get preliminary results or do you get late results and things like that. So what we can compute is basically very simple and, and well known if you, if you have worked with Spark or any kind of data processing uh, infrastructure. Basically, we have uh, ele element-wise processing, so filters, things like that. Um, then aggregation, grouping, ordering, things like that, and then the combination of all this, so you can combine that arbitrary. Um, so very straightforward. If you look at our example again, uh, for instance here I have an example about log lines where I want to extract some information. Um, so I get my, my data in, and that pretty much looks like that what we just saw for uh, Flume Java. We have our data source, we do some processing, um, extraction of key, key value pairs, and then we do an aggregation at the end. So it's very straightforward. Um, now if we, if we um, apply that to our data set that we have here, we basically have to wait till we, ha we are at the end of the data set. We put that data that in, we run this uh, these aggregation and, and filters on it, and then at the end we get a result. So here in this case we get a result 51. But again, and I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but we have to wait till the end of this batch to actually do this calculation. So now there are a couple of things that you can do to actually get some in insights um, and like how you group your data. I mentioned a couple of those already, um, just to generalize them again. The first one is fixed, like a fixed windowing basically, where you take a fixed amount of time and you group your data into this fixed amount of time. But again, you don't group your data based on your processing time, you group them based on your event time to get, get re uh, correct results. Another thing that you can do is sliding windows, so windows that are overlapping. Uh, for instance, you have like 30 minute windows and they are overlapping and like they are shifting by a minute. So you have like 30, 30 or not 29 overlapping windows basically. You shift them always by a minute and you do aggregations for these 30 minute windows by one minute shifting. And the third one is um, that I mentioned before is like sessions, for instance, where you actually take data from information from your data that is streaming into the system. So not only the time that the events are happened or the time when, when you're processing, you actually take data out of your, um, or in, like, yeah, data, data piece out of your data to use for the windowing in, in your system. So for instance, uh, a user ID or some kind of session ID. So as an example here, so where in event time are, am I processing it? Um, to do that in, in the Apache Beam uh, programming model, you apply a window function onto your input data set, and you define like, what, what this window looks like. So here in this example, I use a fixed window of a duration, and here I'm using a two-minute duration. So this packs all my data basically in two-minute windows, and then again, we do the aggregation that we have done before. So um, we are one step closer to get uh, faster insights, but we are still not there yet. Um, right now we are grouping the elements in the right buckets, uh, but we, we still have to wait till the end of the batch processing till we get the insights for these two minute windows. And we wanna get like faster insight, we wanna get closer to real time. So we need to do uh, one more step. So that's where, again, this graph comes in where we look at the SKU. So basically what you want to do is you want to get as, as close as possible at, uh, to this reality watermark that you have there. Um, and the way that we are doing this is we basically have a heuristic model to define this watermark where I believe um, uh, like data has come in to a certain extent complete. Um, and then we are triggering, we use this watermark to trigger events. 
So this is like basically the when in the processing time we can actually materialize and emit results of the data. So for our example here, we have windowed into two minute windows uh, based on event time. And then we say we define a trigger that says like once the watermark has passed the end of the window, um, then we are triggering the aggregation and then we emit the results. So here's an example uh, how that would look like. So basically we have this heuristic watermark over there and as soon as like the window hits this watermark, we can do the aggregation and we can emit the result. So great, we are a step closer to a real-time uh, system or like uh, faster insights into your data, but we have a problem here. And the problem here is, that you see is this element number nine, basically the event nine that is coming in. We are not looking at that event. So we, we have passed the watermark for this window, we have aggregated, and now this event comes in and we don't really know what to do with it. So we need actually also some functions to consider these events. Like what are we doing with events that are coming in late? And that's where the how comes in, the fourth step in this, uh, or the fourth question in the Apache Beam programming model. So here, again, uh, the first two lines are putting these events by event time into my window. And then we have a trigger, which basically says, like, after the watermark, after the end of the window, we are triggering the result, basically, the result that we trust, and we say, like, this is an on-watermark result. But we also want to have like some preliminary results, so before the watermark was hit, and we also want to deal with late incoming data. Of course, we don't want to keep windows op open forever, because then you run out of memory at some point, and you don't want to have that happen. But you want to give a little bit of leeway uh, till when events actually can come into your system, and you can basically correct the results and, and uh, do that uh, downstream as well. So here in this example, we define two uh, additional triggers. We are finding the trigger. The first one is with early firings. So basically, I have this two-minute window, and um, so we have at least, like from let's say, from the first element that comes in in that window, and let's say that's right at the beginning of that window, till we actually materialize a result or send it downstream, we have at least two minutes plus processing time passing, right? Um, so if you want to get early insights into this data, we can define an early firing trigger. So here in this example is after the first element came in, so after processing time, a minute after the first element comes in for that window, we are actually emitting a result. So this is here uh, after processing time plus delay of and then one minute. So let's say like if we have an event coming in at the very beginning of this fixed window that we have, a minute later, we are emitting a preliminary result. So we know, we kind of get a sense of what the aggregation in this window will look like. And then we also add a so-called late firing trigger. So basically this late firing trigger deals with when, once we have emitted the result, the real result, quote unquote, on the watermark, what are we doing with events that are coming in late? So here we are saying like, okay, I want to emit something uh, if at least one element comes in. So you can also define at like how often do you emit uh, and the re-aggregation of this, of this window based on late incoming uh, data. So for instance, if you say like, okay, there might be a lot of data late coming, then you say like, okay, maybe every 10, ten elements I do a re-aggregation. Um, if you want to get for every element that is coming in late a new aggregation result, then you do uh, after pain element count at least one, which basically means uh, like as soon as one uh, late element comes in, you do a re-aggregation of that uh, window. And then you define, again, I mentioned you don't want to run out of memory with open windows in your system. So you have to actually make a stopgap at some point. At some point, you mu must be able to discard a window. So it is really important that you define this boundary, like how long you're keeping these windows open. And in my case here for this example, I am basically saying like, okay, I want to have 10 minutes of delay that I want to accept for, for this. Um, now, the last part that you have here is, is basically what this trigger is doing for late, for late elements that are coming in. 
And so you have two options. Either you emit a difference to the downstream system. So if a late element comes in, you calculate a difference if that's possible in, in, in your uh, function. And you emit the difference downstream. And the other option, what I'm using here, is ac accumulating fire planes, which basically means you recalculate the entire window and you send downstream the, the new result for that entire uh, window. So how does that look like? Um, pretty simple, basically here you see like, uh, I'm hitting here the one minute mark in my window. Uh, the watermark has not been passed. It's still uh, elements are coming in. The heuristic watermark thinks we have to keep that window open quite a bit past the window has actually uh, from invent time perspective closed. Um, so you get actually two early firings here for this window. First one is seven, let's, uh, next one is 17, till we actually get the on watermark uh, firing of the result for this window. And again, also as you can see here on the left side for our first window, so for the 12 to 12 or two uh, event time window, we, we close this pretty early, uh, so 12 or six in this case. Um, we, uh, we hit the watermark, we emit the aggregation result of five, and then we get this late incoming data piece for this window, and we do a late trigger where we emit a new result for this window. So with these four steps that I just walked you through, and I hope they were somewhat uh, clear to understand, with these four questions that we are asking about our data, uh, and using that in the Apache uh, beam programming model. With these four steps, we can actually can go from a classic batch processing where you have to wait till you have all your data for your batch plus the processing time to get insights of your data uh, early on, uh, even preliminary results for, for your data that you are analyzing. Um, I want to show a little demo. I don't know if the Wi-Fi is going to work now, um, so I might have to play this game by myself. Um, but I want to show this uh, anyway. So what is this about? Um, I want to show, I mentioned like stream processing and batch processing in one model. So the power of this model is actually when you take, if you have your stream processing and you take away all these triggers, um, you actually have a batch pipeline, right? So you can write your stream pipeline or you can start with a batch pipeline the way you want. Uh, and then you can run them in both modes. And I want to show this an example. So that I'm going to start first with a streaming pipeline. I've coded a very simple game um, where you get assigned a user ID, you get assigned the color, a team that you're playing for, and then the four color dots are changing very quickly. And you have to basically hit that color dot for your team um, before it switches. Um, and I'm re registering basically hits and misses of your tapping on the, on the right color um, circle. These uh, events are sent to a backend um, uh, that I wrote in Go, um, and basically uh, connects your, the app connects through a WebSocket to this backend. I'm receiving these events and send them to PubSub. So PubSub is our massively scalable uh, message bus. And this message bus um, connects to my uh, Apache Beam pipeline that I'm running in, in Dataflow. So it's getting all these pops up messages, uh, doing some processing. And so one thing that I'm doing is I'm going to do a five minute window where I update you every 10 seconds. So um, if you start playing the game, after roughly 10 seconds, you see what your personal score is, as well as like what the overall team score, score is. And then uh, basically after five minutes, I, I uh, define the end of like the session and say like this is uh, the team scores for, for this five minute window. And then what I'm also doing is, um, and that is very easy to do in these pipelines, is you can fork at any point in time. Uh, so you can, a uh, very good practice is that you uh, store your, your raw data somewhere in a very scalable uh, data store. So one of them that we have uh, available is BigQuery. It's basically an uh, OLAP system where you can store massive data, uh, data and can process it, um, also distribute in a distributed manner with SQL. So it's a massive, massively scalable SQL analytics database. And you can uh, stream this data directly into, into BigQuery. So I'm streaming that also into BigQuery so that I can do some post-processing if I want to. Um, so if you want to play, 
um, with me that game, you can scan this QR code um, and it should show you a web page. So I'm, going, I'm going to leave that here on the side. Let me see. I hope you can still scan it. Maybe. Funktioniert? Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to, one second, I bring it back up. I hope I just have to organize myself with the small resolution here. Um, all right. So, so here's the QR code. I hope you can still scan it. Let me know if you can't, and I will make it bigger. Uh, yeah, I'll zoom in. Let's zoom in. Nope, that was a bit too much, I guess. Is that good enough? Yeah. All right, so I leave that here. All right, so, okay, some people are playing. So this pipeline is basically running. Uh, I got assigned to the color blue, for instance, and I'm bad usually with this game, but let's try. Um, especially with the mouse. It's much faster with a finger on a mobile phone than with the mouse. So after a while, you will get uh, your personal score. So I have like a success rate of 54%, and then you get also the team score. So currently, Team Red is on a winning uh, project trajectory. So I want to show you really quick like how that looks like in, in the back end. So I have this uh, batch, um, this not batch. I don't want to have the batch. I want to show you the streaming. So I have this streaming um, pipeline running here. And so as you can see, it's reading from PubSub. It's showing me how many events um, there have been. So uh, you all have clicked 1,400, 1,600 times so far. Um, I'm mapping these events to basically I get JSON, pops up messages. I'm cr constructing a table row, which is suitable for BigQuery out of this. I'm writing this directly to BigQuery. You see here like 18 uh, elements per second. This can go into hundreds, thousands, even millions seconds per um, elements per second. So very scalable. And then I'm win uh, windowing uh, this, these events. I'm creating two windows. One is by team that you got assigned to get the team score, and one is the uh, uh, player. So you got all got assigned the UID, and based, I do basically the window, uh, create multiple windows on the same data to calculate team and player stats. So how does that look like in code? I guess some people here want to see some code. I want to show some code. Um, so all this is uh, um, available uh, as a Java SDK as well as Python, and then we are also working on a Go uh, SDK. So for, for the Java one, you basically um, just include the Apache Beam SDK, uh, Java Core. Uh, currently, we are in version 2.6, so this is actually pro progressing. Um, this has been open source around two years ago. Um, and the nice thing about the uh, starting with two, uh, version 2.4, is that you actually use the stock Apache Beam SDK to run it on, on Dataflow uh, servers as a managed service. So you don't have a specialized uh, Google SDK to write your, your pipelines. You can literally use like the stock Apache Beam SDK and run it directly on your laptop to do uh, debugging and testing. You can run it on Apache Flink and many, many more uh, runners that are out there. Um, to run it on, on Google Cloud Dataflow, you have another uh, uh, dependency that you add that, so that like, all the additional uh, things like options are coming in for, for Dataflow. So how does this pipeline look like? Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, let me try to make that a little bigger. Um, so basically, I hope it's... Is that visible in the back to some extent? Okay, good. Um, so basically, uh, I'm starting with some pipeline options, uh, just basic stuff, like what is the project where this pipeline is running in, like wh where are my temp locations, uh, things like that. And the first thing that I'm doing is I'm going to read from, from my topic. So this is my PubSub topic. Um, I'm having an attribute on these PubSub messages, so the time when this event happened, I attach as an attribute to to the PubSub message, and I'm using this for the event time windowing. Um, next thing I, I'm doing is basically I'm mapping these elements. So what I'm here doing is literally just a, a transformation of my PubSub message to to a table table row. 
Uh, and that is a, a parallel process, like a parallel step. So uh, for all the events like that are coming in, this can be done in, in parallel. The next thing uh, I'm doing is I'm basically sending this unfiltered into, into BigQuery. Um, to show you that I'm not doing any magic here, it's literally I'm defining a, a schema for the table that I'm writing into, and then I'm taking the table row that I'm getting and writing that directly into the table. So there's no magic there. Next thing is um, I'm doing the windowing. So I mentioned I am do five minute windows. Um, I'm doing early firings every 10 seconds. I'm doing late firings when there is one element that is coming in late. And I allow for 10 minutes of, of staleness, so to say, like 10 minutes after I have emitted a res like the on watermark. So this is basically the how, um, and a couple of the, uh, uh, the, the when and where's. And then I'm calculating the team stats here. So I'm writing these team stats again also to BigQuery, so I have a record of this. And then I'm writing the, them back to PubSub. So PubSub, it goes back to my backend, which is connected to your phone. And then I'm sending you via WebSocket um, the results of your personal score, as well as like the, the uh, the team score. So that's all there is to this pipeline to make this uh, little game uh, possible. Now, I also want to show really quick how the, uh, the batch pipeline looks like. Um, I'm actually going to run this batch pipeline really quick. So this is the batch pipeline. Maybe we are lucky and it, um, it finishes before my, my time runs out. Still have 10 minutes, so we should be good. Um, so what am I doing in this batch pipeline? So basically what I'm doing here is, and it's a lot less code as you can see, is I'm reading my, my like events history from my BigQuery table. So colorsmesh.all is like where every individual event goes in. I'm in extracting the event timestamp from these events um, so that I can group them uh, based on this event time. And creating the session window, as I hear in this case, I, I'm doing like 30, 30 minutes uh, session windows. So this captures basically the time that you ha all have played. So I want to know like which team actually uh, won. Um, and then I'm doing the same things that I'm doing for, um, that I did before for the team stats. So I'm basically calculating uh, the session team stats and also the all-time team stats. So session is for the 30 minute session that we had. And then the all time is basically, I have done that demo uh, a couple of times um, while traveling and, and presenting about data flow. So we're going to see like, which team is actually uh, winning currently. All right. So let's have a look at if this, where this batch pipeline is right now. So we have the batch pipeline running here. Uh, you can see that we, we started that, so we're reading the hist uh, historic activity from our all um, table. So let me just show you how that looks like really quick, the data in this table. Um, so I'm going to color smash, and I want to have select um, state from, and then all, um, let's say order, by uh, timestamp uh, descending, and then we say limit 20. See if my query skills failed me. So this is what the individual events look like. So they're literally, um, just wanted to show you that I'm not tracking any, any PII data here. Um, so what you see here is basically the timestamp when the event happened, your, the user ID of the player, which team that player was on, and which color that player hit, and on what, what kind of device that player was, if, like, if it was a, a mobile or um, a desktop device. So now, let's see where we are. Uh, we see actually the, the uh, data has, like the pipeline, the batch pipeline has finished. Um, it looks like, yeah, everything succeeded, that's good. Um, Demogods were, were good to me. Um, so the first thing is basically we're doing here the, uh, the all-time stats, and then we are also calculating the uh, session stats. So we have about 130 sessions that we 
that we uh, per, um, persisted to BigQuery, and then we have, um, I think, one, one alt, like four all-time stats that we persisted to BigQuery. So, so now let's have a look um, how that looks like in BigQuery. So now I'm doing the team stats one. Um, I want to have by timestamp, and I want to run this. So let's see. So now we see here for this session, uh, we had 10 players, no, we had 29, 33 players. So thank you for all the 33 people that played. One of them was me. Um, we had around 1,200 events um, that basically were, were committed in this or like sent to this little game. And we see that the hit rate, uh, the best hit rate is for red with 53% hit rate. So about 1,000 events um, from a mobile device for this. And if you look at all time, we have here the all time. So I probably have to increase this a little bit. Let's say 100. And so we have all, here is are the all time. So we see here red is also the, no, yellow is the all time winner. Uh, with 56% hit rate and about uh, 12,000 events. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. Four minutes left. Um, I'm almost done. Just want to show you this is basically the batch pipeline that we have run that we have just seen. Um, if you want to find out like on which runners uh, Apache Beam models are running, there's beam.apache.org, and there's a runner's capability matrix. You see there, there are so many runners now that it's basically non-visible. It's just schematic, these screenshots. Um, but you see there, like Apache Fing, Spark, Apex, Gearpump, Hadoop Maverick Use, GStorm, IBM Streams, and Apache Samsa. So there are a lot of runners that actually support the Apache Beam model by now. And with this, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the next three minutes, I think. <laughs> and you can also, no, thank you. I will also be around for a little longer um, during lunch. So if you have any questions, like also feel free to walk up uh, to me. I will be the one with the red jacket with the elaborations on the back. No questions? Thank you very much. So my question would be uh, how to deal with uh, scaling and resilience, etc. Is this all left to the runners? Yes. So um, that's that, so the question was like how to deal with uh, with scaling. So. If you use our service, we basically do the scaling for you. You define how many nodes you want to have and what the, how beefy the machines are that you want to use, and then we do the scaling for you in these boundaries. Um, if you run them on any of the other runners, it depends on if you use a managed service um, for like on running on Flink or something, or if you have the infrastructure yourself. So if you basically uh, run an Apache Flink infrastructure, you are responsible for dealing with the uh, scaling on an Apache Blink. But basically, as much as the resources that are available on your infrastructure, um, you can find boundaries when you run your uh, pipeline, but that's basically the, um, done by the, by the underlying infrastructure. So you don't have to do any boundaries in your pipelines. And the serialization? Yeah. Uh, and what about the serialization options? Is this an also push down to the runtime? Yes, so what, what exactly do you mean by serialization option? Um, I mean, you are transferring objects and events, etc. So yeah. this ha has to get on the wire somehow. Yes, yes, correct. So basically state and everything to, uh, and the communication between individual parts of like the compute infrastructure is all handled by the underlying system. So Apache Flink, for instance, handles that for you, or Dataflow handles that for you. Um, for Dataflow, we also have uh, something new, which we call a shuffle service. So one of the most compute intensive uh, pieces in, in these data pipelines is actually the shuffling and sorting and things like that. And we have a very specialized infrastructure for that, which is not running on the compute machines that you're provisioning with us. It's basically a separate uh, service, which is much more performant in the uh, shuffling and sorting stuff. And you basically pay per use for that service. Are there more questions? 
All right. Too Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>